uh, chapter 13 of Spiritual Strategies, and we'll look at natural parallels and spiritual warfare. Let's always begin with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that uh, you and your wisdom have called us to study your word and to understand the battles that are about us. We pray, oh God, as we gather today and uh, dig further into it, that you open our hearts and our minds to the reality of the world around us and how we can exercise kingdom authority to overcome the works of the enemy and no victory in our lives and victory for our communities and our families. We pray, O oh Lord, that today uh, uh, you would be our teacher, that you would guide us into all truth and understanding. We pray this in your name. Amen. So it's... Uh, as we go further along in this study, uh, we're getting into more and more nitty-gritty and interesting stuff. That's what I call it. So it, we're talking about uh, practical applications of how we take on the kingdom of darkness and how it's defeated, understanding his strategies. Are, are any of you superstitious about 13, the number 13? <laughs> Chapter 13. <laughs> it's, it's like the forbidden chapter. You should never have it. So I shouldn't eat on camera. Do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're looking at natural uh, parallels or spiritual <clears throat> warfare. So upon completion of this chapter, you'll be able to write the key verse from memory. Uh, explain why warfare is used to describe the conflict between good and evil, which we really have covered already. Summarize natural principles of warfare ap applicable to spiritual warfare, which is one of my favorite ways of doing things, and apply natural principles of warfare in the spiritual realms. So uh, I would like someone to read for me in a big loud voice 1 Timothy 1.18. Well, that's our key verse. Who would do that? Sure. Thank you. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. So we need to fight the good fight, uh, and even prophetically, uh, that we get involved in the conflict that is before us. So we've talked about uh, the armor of God, uh, the war that is about that, us. We've already have made it clear that we're involved in warfare and what that battle is all about. Um, the, the Bible is full of what we call metaphors and analogies. And it's terrible because I have a pet peeve about metaphors and analogies. So but it's because the Bible's full of them. So Jesus spoke in parables because of people's unbelieving hearts. Remember that? So how does that make sense? Why would you bury something in a, in a parable or a metaphor rather than tell them what it is? Why, how does that help an unbelieving heart? being told directly just puts up your wall of defense even higher probably so putting it into a story that you might at least relate to and come back to and consider later might help a person to finally work through to their own place of understanding yes and be able to hold that closer to the ground it's very good as an educator that's correct so you, you begin with a point of relevance where the person has already accepted something, has practiced something, this is part of their regular life. And where you say, well, what I'm showing you isn't different than that. It's a continuation of that you already believe. So uh, Paul would use that technique in the book of Acts where he goes to a Greek city. He finds in the Greek city a pantheon of gods and he's chatting with them and he points to a statue of the unknown God, stuff they already believe in and follow. 
and say, let me expand on that. And let me tell you who that is. So that's, that's a great way. That's what a metaphor does. So uh, it's great to use farming metaphors with farmers and military uh, <clears throat> metaphors with soldiers and on and on and on. Now, um, the purpose is to move the person from the metaphor you're using to a new insight. My pet peeve is we tell the metaphor and we just repeat the metaphor without getting the new insight. So it is a metaphor to say, I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. And I say, are you saved? And you say, yes, I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Yes, but what does that mean? You're, you're saying that, but do you know what it means? And unfortunately, I've asked people expressions like that. So what does that mean to you? And they can't explain it. So they, they got lost in the metaphor and uh, move on. We've found uh, a truth throughout history of the church that uh, ministers like myself and preachers and even Jesus himself have often used metaphors and people get stuck in the metaphor and never go beyond it to understand what it means. So, and then all metaphors can go wrong. How, how does a metaphor go wrong? <laughs> When you say, well, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It doesn't mean it is a mustard seed. It's just like a mustard seed. But that you know, only in the similarity in, in this one little area. That doesn't mean you study mustard seeds and everything about that mustard seed now applies to the kingdom of God. That, then you've missed it. The, the metaphor takes over the truth. So we have to be very careful how we handle metaphors and parallels, but there is, once you learn to handle them correctly, a great um, uh, truth that can be revealed. And at the bit, bottom of page 154, Emmanuel says, the same is true in relationship to warfare. There are many principles of natural warfare which have been studied and applied by experts at physical war. These natural principles are applicable in the spiritual world. So this chapter presents a natural warfare and applies them in the spiritual realm. And it reveals why God used natural warfare to describe an ongoing spiritual war in which believers engaged. There is a uh, principle... Uh, there are two expressions I want to give you that are probably not in the manual here. One is progressive revelation. Progressive revelation. I might have talked about this before. But this is like uh, going through school. You start at kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, all the way up to grade 12. And each year, that you go to school is meant to built on the year prior, right? So we just don't throw five-year-olds into grade 12 and think that they're going to do well. We have a plan by which we build on the previous year. Well, just because you're in grade six doesn't mean you forget grade one, does it? If <laughs> but everything you learned in grade one still applies. It still applies. It's still foundational. Even when you're in grade 12, what, there was a book out a while back that said, everything I ever needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. So <laughs> it, it, it doesn't go away. It, it, it might be elementary, but it's essential. It, you still are building on it. And uh, we think of the Bible that way, from Genesis to Revelation. It's the same thing. It's a progression of revelation upon revelation. And what is revealed in Genesis sets you up to understand Exodus. And then what you understand in Exodus sets you up to understand Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So when you're reading the Bible and you just jump right into John, the Gospel of John, maybe straight to John 3, if you don't understand Genesis 1, you're going to have a hard time understanding John 1. <laughs> because there are, John is a, a further revelation that builds on the revelation in Genesis 1 
when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and all things were created through him. He, he's adding a whole other layer. He's not replacing Genesis. He's adding a, a revelation built on the previous revelation. So that's why it's essential. We have groups like Answers in Genesis um, that are corrective for us. One of the reasons they were formed, uh, you can Google that, and find them online. They built a big ark down in the States that you can go visit. But their main argument is the church has neglected uh, the book of Genesis and has stopped believing in it. And when you do that, that's like forgetting grade one. And, and the rest, if everything you built on that starts crumbling away. If you start adopting evolution, thinking that we sort of evolved and God, God didn't create us, then, then you end up in a whole lot of trouble later on because all the, the following revelations are built on that premise. So they've worked hard for years to try to shore up that foundation of Genesis and encouraging uh, preachers and churches to, uh, to hold to those primary truths that we find in Genesis. So we want to do the same thing. So when it comes to war, we use progressive revelation. Uh, in the Bible, are there stories of horrendous, brutal, violent wars? And I have videotapes of people confronting street evangelists saying, your Bible teaches slavery, genocide, and all this terrible wars. It's found in the Old Testament. I can show you where it is. So how do we handle that? It is there. There's huge, there's women driving tent pegs through the skulls of men. There's, it's just horrible, horrendous stuff. There's a hero of faith about to commit infanticide and kill his own son. I mean, how horrendous can you get? <laughs> right? It's all in there. But what we do is we look at that and say, uh, Genesis is not the fullness of Revelation, nor is Exodus or Deuteronomy. It actually says in the New Testament, it said, at the fullness of time, Jesus came and was revealed. He couldn't come earlier. We needed a whole lot of stuff revealed and understood before we could comprehend Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. That's such a mind-blowing idea. We needed thousands of years just to get to the point where we could accept that. And there are plenty of people who still can't because they haven't accepted the earlier revelations. So what does war and all that violence in the Old Testament show us in progressive revelation? Is there a greater revelation than wiping out the Canaanites or defeating the Egyptians? And what would that be? Jesus. Yes, it's a good Sunday <laughs> school answer. answer. It's <laughs> Jesus. It's Jesus. So the progression, progression of Revelation is tied up in one of our key verses we learned earlier in Ephesus has said that our struggle is not with flesh and blood, that's Old Testament, but with principalities and powers of the air, New Testament. And so there is a struggle, there is a war, but it won't be settled by the sword of metal but by the sword of the spirit there's still sword there's still warfare but it's not the warfare we thought it was it's a different war so that's the progression of the revelation well then if if that's true then do we just ignore and say well they just got it wrong all those battles fought and all those commands of god about warfare in the old testament because they weren't ready for a New Testament revelation? Well, the answer is no. Because beyond progressive revelation, there's also another thing called foreshadowing. Have you ever heard that word? To foreshadow. Um, it is good when you're trying to teach people to think in new ways and to receive a greater revelations to use foreshadowing where you're alluding to something without fully telling them what it is so that they're more prone to receive it. 
They accept it when it finally dawns on them. And in the Bible, God often uses a foreshadowing all the way through. Um, part of it is a, a literal uh, reading of the word where uh, if you look at the story of Moses and the tabernacle, so there he is, he's leaving Egypt, and God calls him up to the mountain. And God shows Moses the temple of God in heaven. And then he lays out a plan of a tent tabernacle that Moses is supposed to build on earth. That's a copy of the temple in heaven. It's all got all the essential ingredients. And it's a shadow of the real thing. It's not the thing itself, it is a shadow of it. So in fact, the, the tabernacle that Moses built with all the craftsmen uh, was designed by God as a concrete object lesson <laughs> of something they couldn't see. So this is a foreshadowing of heaven itself. So that's what foreshadowing is. And from that, we learn a lot of lessons. And then Jesus used the same one to say, uh, you've been worshiping at the temple, you've got the Holy of Holies, the Holies, the outer court, you, you sacrificial right, and you get all that. And then he says, now you're ready for the next phase, which is, I tell you a time is coming where you will neither worship God on mountaintops or at the temple, but in spirit and in truth. And then, then the New Testament we learn, you are the temple of the living God. You are, not brick and stone, not the tent that Moses made. That was a foreshadowing. That was an object lesson. But now, you, when you receive the Holy Spirit in you, that's like the Ark of the Covenant entering the temple. And you've got an inner court, not a court. So all those symbols and imageries become a, a foreshadowing of describing a very real experience and help us understanding what's happening within us. So for, uh Progressing revelation and foreshadowing is the way that we can look at all that material and not throw it out. It has New Testament implications for us. Okay? Any question about that principle before I move on? Because that's a biggie. You got it all? All right. Now, war in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of spiritual war. A physical war in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of spiritual war. So in the past, they fought against human beings with swords and spears, and arrows, and, but they understood that there were God, God was fighting false gods as this took place. But now we fight with the word of the spirit and with the fruit of the spirit and spiritual gifts, and we take that on. But the techniques that God prescribed for warfare in the Old Testament can also be uh, strategies that we use in the New Testament era in the church age now that we apply today. So if you get that principle, then you can read the Old Testament in a whole new light where you say, okay, well, the Magogs aren't my problem, but Satan is, and he was behind them, and he still needs to be defeated. And there's a strategy used here in this story that I could use in my war room and when I'm praying, all right? Have you ever come across a strategy like that that you've used or understood? Have you found one that's worked for you? I, uh, I've, we do uh, basic war room training at the beginning here as people are sitting in the war room. So I, I give them a few of my favorites. And one is Elijah, uh, the great prophet. Uh, he's an intelligence officer. He prays and he talks to God and God shows him what the enemies of Israel are doing, especially one king who keeps wanting to invade and destroy them. But God shows Elijah what that guy's up to. And then he goes to the king and he says, hey, they're going to launch attack on this day from here. and You need to be ready. And they listen to Elijah. And, and the foreign king is really getting frustrated because, hey, he, he thinks there's a traitor in his cap because someone's telling you know, the opposition of what we're doing before we do it. We can't win if we keep this up. 
And then they finally tell him, no, no, it's, we're all loyal to you. It's the prophet Elijah. He's the problem. He knows what you're eating, when you sleep. He knows everything about you. There are no secrets with him. And so the foreign king sends an entire army after Elijah to take out this guy because he's the problem. So the, the army is marching towards him. And Elijah sees him coming and he's got a, a helper. And, he's, and the helper is afraid. And he said, don't be afraid. The greater are those that are with us than those that are with them. And he prays for his servant's eyes to be opened. And he sees the army of God all about them. And what is the beauty of it is Elijah never uses it. He says a simple prayer. And he asks that the army marching against him would go blind. So they all lose their sight. And a mighty army against one man is nothing. <laughs> if you can't see. You, you've just lost everything. And then he walks up to him gently and he said, hey, are you guys lost? Do you need help? And he said, yeah, we can't see, this is terrible. And they all put one hand on the shoulder of the person ahead of them. He marches them right into the city that they were going to attack. And after Israel's armies all around them and, and they're in there disarmed, he prays for them to get their sight back and suddenly they can see and they realize they're surrounded, it's over. The commander of the Israel army says, should we slaughter them? They say, oh, no, no, just have a church potluck, feed them, treat them well, and send them on their way. He defeated an entire army without one shot, not any loss of life, nothing. And it was over a technique, over sight and blindness, and then convincing the enemy uh, you, that they can't win, no matter what they do, they couldn't win. There is a book called The Art of War. Have you ever heard of that? And one of the principles in The Art of War is uh, the best uh, battle plan is the one you win before you fight. <laughs> You've already won before you even begun. And uh, that's what Elijah did. Uh, his technique, his strategy, he already won the battle even before there was a fight. It was a foregone conclusion. And the enemy went away uh, discouraged, disheartened, and why even launch an army if this is what they could do? There's no point. It's useless. It doesn't matter what we do. And then you've just diffused the whole thing. You've won the conflict. So how does that Old Testament story I just told you, you apply to a prayer that I might be praying for people today? How could I use that strategy? Could I use that strategy today? So the simple method is to say, well, in the Old Testament, it was this physical army was the problem. They were the enemy. Who's my enemy today? It's demonic powers. So if it was effective to blind the enemy so that he couldn't strategize or work against the prophet, would it be effective for me to pray and blind against my enemy today? that he could not see, nor perceive, nor understand what's happening. And would that give me an advantage in advancing the kingdom of God? Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say, now do this and this and this, that way. But that's how you use a progressing of revelation with foreshadowing. That same strategy that God led the man of God in doesn't change. It's still the same strategy. It's just applied in a more targeted and specific way against the real enemy for the purpose of redeeming people. If I understand that the power of the opposition that it face is his primarily his schemes and lies and strategies, but that the, all schemes and lies and strategies rely on intelligence and information. And if you cut that off, what does that do to the enemy? If he doesn't know what's going on, it cripples him in a huge way because that's where his major strength is. So if he doesn't see it coming, he's in trouble, right? And throughout history, you see that again and again. The enemy is often caught flat-footed. Oh, then 
and then confusion in his camp. So I can pray for those things just like Elijah did. But rather than against a person, I pray it against demonic forces. Make sense? So that's this principle applied. Um, Do you find yourself praying a lot in that way? Because honestly, I mean, it, it, it's become a good go-to for me, and I, I'm thankful for that. But it... <sighs> I feel like it comes to mind more often than maybe it needs to, or maybe, I don't know. It seems to be um, in the forefront a lot, let's put it that way. In my mind. Where do you think it's coming from to, that it keeps coming to the forefront for you? Well, you brought up a number of times where, um, you know, you're not, the person who, um, say, say they're being a difficult person. It's not that the actual the human, individual. The, the individual that is the difficulty. It's actually the spiritual forces. Yes. Right. So if you were going to pray, part of the prayer can be around the unseen forces that are mm -hmm. having an impact there. Right. Yes. So, um, I, I consider that primary. Uh, that's, there are many ways to pray. How I determine that is uh, by observation and, and by asking the Lord, what's really going on and what do I need to pray against? Rather than get in the habit of praying against the specific things. So um, if, if, it, if strategies are based on intelligence, then so too are God's strategies. What I love about reading about the battles and the wars of the Old Testament is God is constantly defeating other armies against overwhelming odds. But what I love about it, he rarely does it the same way. He keeps employing different tactics. So what I observe from that is God may have many different ways of doing it. So what is helpful is the intelligence we need for strategy is not to observe the enemy, but to pay attention to the new and creative way that God wants to move mm -hmm. to, to take the field. Who knows? It might be jars and torches one day, and then another day it's something else, you know? Who knows how he wants to do it? But he's got a strategy. Uh, as good as our enemy is at a strategy, God is better, and he has good strategies. So I need to rely on the intelligence from the Holy Spirit telling me uh, how to do it. That's why we recommend the methodology of prayer journals where you use stream of consciousness with the Holy Spirit, where you ask the Lord, you consult with him. It's good for you to read the Old Testament and see how he has done it, and then go to the Holy Spirit and say, and how do you want to do it now? And then let him lead you into the strategy that he has. So there are times that he'll tell me to continually to pray for a certain thing in a certain way, and then he'll change it up and say, well, no, no longer that, now go to this. And, and I've got to follow those promptings and go in that direction. So uh, being sensitive to how God is leading you is really critical. Uh, if you feel like he keeps leading you to the same place, persist, because there are many cases in the Bible where persisting on a particular front is how we win. Uh, especially bringing down walls. Um, I want, you don't have the full manuals with you, do you? So when you get the full manual, if you get it online, we always have the link on our YouTube account when we record these videos. In the back of that, uh, on page 341, there's an appendix, and it's entitled Decisive Battles of the Bible. And uh, it goes and talks about general principles that you can list. Principle one, two, three, four, there's uh, nine big principles that you can learn from the big battles of the Bible. Okay, so I, I'm giving you a couple, but there's more there. There's, we got, they're all listed in this manual, right? So uh, 341 and 342 and 343, that gives you that. And then um, there is this, after that, it gives you a, a beautiful study. I really like this one on 343. 
uh, and it's uh, gives you an appendix of the battles of all the battles of the Bible. <laughs> it lists them and says uh, what they were, who fought them, what the scriptural references are, uh, the battleground, the opposing forces, the reason for the battle, and then it lists in point form the strategies in each battle. And then what you can do is take that and, and learn, well, are these techniques I can use today <laughs> as I pray and intercede on behalf of other people? So if you want to really get into a fascinating series on your own, in that appendix, look it up. It, there is just a wealth of information there, and more than I have time to cover. All right? But those are uh, nine principles in the back there that you can find that directly relate to this chapter. Oh, I'm not going to get through this if I keep going on like this. So uh, the natural parallels of spiritual warfare uh, are in this sense of progress, progressive revelation and foreshadowing. Uh, we can look at a simple definition of war, I mean, this isn't too complicated, is the act of force intended to compel our opponent to fulfill our will, whatever way you want to put it. A wartime lifestyle, when the nation is at war, a lifestyle of that nation is affected. Men give up their jobs to fight for the nation. They spend hours in preparation training. Funds are drawn from the economy and funneled towards the war. Residents are alert to invasion and extra guards are posted on national borders. In spiritual warfare, would you do the same thing? If you're going into battle, do you have to alter your lifestyle? Do you have to change how you do things? Do you have to get training? Do you, do you need to expect an invasion and a counterattack and protect your ground? And all these same principles apply in spiritual warfare. Uh, the same things apply. And we might have to rearrange how we handle our wealth and our resources and how we apply them as we engage in war. It becomes literally a lifestyle. It, it affects everything you do and how you operate. And then you develop uh, people who come back from wars uh, have, what, what is that problem they have? PTSD. And what, what does that stand for? And what is that? Not being able to process the, the violence and the issues that they saw during their time in the battle, that they're not able to, that it creates more um, traumatic events in their own present lives, and the, tra the trauma uh, is brought forward. And in fact, uh, a lot of people who suffer it uh, have wanted to go back to and do another tour of duty because they were more at home there than they were in peacetime at home. Well, the trauma makes sense in that violence. It makes sense there, where and Your people understand it. So, uh, how long has this been around? That people have had this modern warfare. It's not just modern. I mean, no. Did you know before. that in medieval times that knights had this? And there was cultural customs of reintegrating uh, a knight or a soldier from the from wars back into the community. And part of them was they would dunk the knight. <laughs> they, they would wash them. The whole community would show up and put them in the water, take their armor off and cleanse them. But there was a, a way of reintegrating them into society where they recognized, yeah, you've been to a bad place and terrible but you need to be washed of that. You need to be cleaned of it. And there was ways of cooling down the hot night so that they could not be so violent in a peaceful society. Part of it is that in war, you're trained to be on uh, heightened alert, ready for a shot or a bomb or attack from any quarter, and then to act right away so that you could be effective in survival and protecting your platoon. And when you come back, you still, you know, 
bang, you know, what's that? You know, you drop down the ground, roll, fire back, you know, do that kind of thing. You, you're, you're still in that point. So there has to be this cooling down from that, that integration back into society. Soldiers have always had this issue. It, it, your, your adrenaline's up and, you, and you've been up for so long, you've got to have time to transition where you bring that all back down again. So when you're in wartime, you're in that mode. You're in this heightened, oh no, what's now? Um, so when you enter a spiritual warfare, it, you're pretty, you can develop a heightened sense of awareness of what's going on around you that other people don't see or get. Now, does that help or hinder you? Another word people have used for that is, you're paranoid. You, you believe conspiracy theories. You're, you're really not with it. So one of the reasons people have a hard time with the material I'm teaching with is it calls for a heightened awareness of the spiritual warfare around us. But to others, that's perceived as a mental illness. Would it not? It only makes sense if we are actually in this condition of spiritual warfare. So then that begs the question, is this a lifestyle you want? <laughs> Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. It just... Well, it, it, you've you got to develop a war-style lifestyle if you're going to survive a war. It makes no sense if there's no war. So that's the beginning point. Are you we in a war or are we not in a war? And if we're not in a war, this is counterproductive and harmful to you. We are. But if we're in a war, you need to develop a heightened sense of awareness. My son in the military of the United States Air Force uh, has learned how to walk into an area and do a threat assessment. He can walk into a building, he can identify profiles of people and say, that person's not a threat, this person is, and I need to watch them. <laughs> so anytime he walks into a room, he's assessing. He's always assessing. Where are these people at? Who's a problem? Who do I need to keep an eye on? That's how his training is. Uh, because he perceives the world as full of threats and possible dangerous situations. He, he now teaches other people to do that, <laughs> how to do the threat assessments. So there's the physical, the natural. Is there a parallel in spiritual warfare? Do we need to do threat assessments? Or do we need to be aware of the potential problems and then strategize against them before they become a problem? See, so that's how the principle works. It, it, you, you can discover all kinds of huge truths just applying this principle, all right? All the way through. The objective of, of war is what? To win, all right? <laughs> you wanna win, you don't wanna lose, all right? Uh, and to gain victory, the same is true for the spiritual warfare, duh, okay. So each soldier in a natural army has a different position responsibility in the battle. The same is true for the spiritual world. We all have our part to play. Uh, you don't have to win this battle on your own. You're, you are one uh, soldier in the midst of many soldiers that have been around for 2,000 years. We've been fighting this battle. And it's been an ongoing war. Uh, your goal is follow orders, do your bit, do what God directs you to do. There's always training for warfare. We call it basic training and learning what it is to be a good soldier. I'm gonna move on. Because we've talked a lot about basic training already. Propaganda. Oh, I could spend all day on this one, especially in the light of last week. But propaganda. <laughs> what is propaganda? Lies. That's all it is. It, it, it are lies and deceptions that the enemy uses to uh, cripple your war effort. Uh, misinformation, misdirection. We've even come up with new words like disinformation, which is fake news, basically. Uh, 
where we say, hey, this is news, this is just happening, look at this. But what we're looking at is a deception. It's not really happening, that's not really what's going on. But it's got us looking over there rather than looking over here. Uh, so propaganda has been used throughout the wars. Uh, Nazi Germany used propaganda, the Japanese used propaganda. Just about every nation they ever got went to war used to propaganda. Against the enemy and against your own people. Because have countries lied to their own people about what's going on in the war? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't it, get upset, everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Be so be aware. That's, uh, that's more in the enemy's uh, category. We don't fight wars like the enemy does. So when you look for spiritual principles, please reconsider whether you should use propaganda. I don't use propaganda. I use the truth. Uh, and the truth will set you free. The truth is my weapon. But the enemy uses propaganda all the time. He injects false propaganda in your mind if you allow it. Personally, he'll, he'll whisper lies to you. If you will learn more about this when you saddle body in the mind in chapter 15 when we get down there. Uh, but is there, let me ask you, do you think there's a cultural wars going on right now in the world? Do you think a lot of the cultural wars are directed towards Christians and Christian values? And is that globally? Then in this war, is there propaganda used against Christians? That's the best propaganda at all, if uh, uh, spokesman. You might know a TV station called, uh, is it RTF or RT? And it's a news station, and that re literally refers to Russia. Uh, and it's a Russian arm of, uh, of news broadcasting. And it's interesting to watch because they're pro-Russia and they're anti-America. There are news stations that are pro-China, they're, they're paid for and bought by China, and they broadcast in the United States, and everything they do is to make China look good. But it's propaganda is what it is. And there are other stations that do the same thing. How, how can you identify propaganda? How do you know if it's propaganda? This is a big issue of our day. We're, we're in a propaganda war like you've never seen. Yeah, these days, what isn't propaganda? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, these days, what isn't propaganda? It all seems like propaganda to us now. It, it, there is a lot of it. Well, you, you know what the truth is, and then you compare it to what you're being told, and you know there's propaganda. The other way is a parallel with your kids. If your children, if you had a family of three or five kids, you realize that... Um, or a pack of friends, that a lie is being told when everyone has the same story and uses the same words. It's called rehearsed deception. And, and it, that's literally propaganda. We said, well, mom's gonna find out about this, so let's get our story straight. What's our story of how we cover for this? Because we don't wanna be into trouble. So they rehearse the story. Now, have you got, especially you got to make sure the youngest gets it right. Because <laughs> the youngest always cracks. And mom knows it. So the, the youngest has got to drill on it. And then mom s suspects something and goes to the youngest because they always crack first. And if that youngest one is just kicking it out precisely and well rehearsed, you know you're listening to propaganda. It's a lie. So if you're watching five new casts and they are all saying the same thing at the same time with the same words what do you think you got going <laughs> it's a rehearsed lie yeah, that's it, it they're all it's just propaganda it's and behind that is the truth so there's a semblance of truth behind that but what you're hearing isn't it it's a narrative <laughs> what we call it today it's another word for a lie <laughs> Big is a story. narrative and that is getting in the way so watch out that's a huge one nowadays 
for instance, is, uh, let me ask you a simple question to test your propaganda skills. Is uh, Joe Biden president of the United States today? No. What is he? Is he president elect? No. He's the successor. He's the he's, he's waiting in the wings. Kind of thing. But he has, has been who issued. declares uh, Biden president elect? Does the news media? No. The voters. Are they? Yes. But is that their position? No. Under the Constitution, nowhere does it say ABC gets to declare who's president-elect. And yet they're all doing it. All of them. A reporter needs to go to the person who has the authority to declare it and say, is he president-elect or is he not? And if you do that right now, the answer is, we don't know. But there is a propaganda machine operating full tilt to say he is. And why would the real officials say, we don't know? Because the count is too close. It's just too close. It took six months with Al Gore with a less close race to decide if he was gonna be president or not. We forget history too. That's an example of propaganda. I'm just using it as an illustration. You're being lied to all the time. And we're falling for it. And we're not aware of this strategy that the enemy uses. What do you think will happen in four months if President Trump wins his cases and the Supreme Court orders an audit, not a recount, an audit of the votes to see if they're legit or not? And then 300,000 of those are disavowed and he wins. Now what happens? It goes against propaganda. There will be civil war. And the propaganda will incite the civil war. So don't fall for propaganda. Don't use it and don't fall for it. Um, you get, it's hard. We fall for it all the time. Diplomatic proposals. One of the strategies of nations at war is to weaken the enemy by a diplomatic proposal. These are suggested, uh, let's make compromises and find peace. Through such proposal, each nation tries to gain advantage over the other. In spiritual warfare, Satan attempts to make believers compromise with sin in order to gain an advantage on us. He said, you know, if you would just give in on this ground, if you would just, accept homosexuality and not make a big thing of it, then you'll have peace and uh, you won't have any problems. He knows that diplomacy like this will result in spiritual weakness, that you give up ground in order to gain peace, and then the enemy is in a better position for attack. He also lulls you into complacency. Uh, just prior to World War II, if you watch the good old war movies I grew up with, you would know this, but <laughs> Uh, one of the things that happened prior to World War II is the uh, United States did not want to get into the war with uh, the European war. And uh, Japan looked like a problem in the Pacific, but Japan had a dipl diplomatic effort going on with the United States all the way up to Pearl Harbor where they were negotiating peace agreements and trade and everything else. So that when Pearl Harbor came, no one saw it coming because they were in peace talks. Well, I say no one except for one analyst. There's a recent remake of Midway Out where they highlight the analyst who saw it coming. He saw through the diplomacy, he observed their behavior and he says, what they're saying, it doesn't match reality. They are preparing for an attack. And after Pearl Harbor, they recognized that the analyst was right when they didn't recognize it before. And they promoted a mob through the rank and listened to him a lot more. And he's the guy who predicted Midway when the Japanese 
trying to hide it from everyone. And the new film out is called Midway. And it's about how this guy knew it was coming, how he got America ready against overwhelming odds, a war, the battle that would have lost the war in the Pacific for the Americans, the Americans ones, because they listened to this intelligence officer. And he, he didn't fall for diplomacy. So we got to be careful about diplomacy as well. When, when uh, the enemy starts striking deals with you, don't fall for it, all right? Uh, he's just trying to weaken your position. Intelligence. When nations are at war, they're always an intricate organization of intelligence. Each side has intelligence forces dedicated to gathering information about the other. The intelligence forces collect and analyze all available information on the enemy. Intelligence is absolutely necessary. Uh, we ask the Lord to show us what we need to know in order to defeat the enemy. And he will show you uh, everything you need to know and then show you what to do to negate what the enemy is up to. I can't tell you how important this is. Almost every war that ever was fought was based on intelligence. Um, there is one uh, war uh, scholar that said, uh, war is deception. <laughs> war is deception. And the more you can deceive the enemy in believing one thing and then attack him in another area, the more likely you are to win. And that's what war is. That most of war is deceiving the other side. So they're not ready for a battle for where you attack. You don't just march, hit them where they're the strongest and hope you win. You look for ways around it and how to take them on. Uh, there are many examples of that through warfare. I can regale you with stories, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, so how do we gain intelligence then? How do we look beyond the enemy's deception? And we can create a lack of intelligence in the enemy. We have the authority to create blindness. And uh, so he's not aware of, we can take that away from him, but we need to gain intelligence. How do we gain intelligence on the enemy and know how to attack? If you lack, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask the Lord for it, right? i tell you about my former associate pastor who took this up in her war journal. She was praying for her family and uh, they were having a hard time. And each day she would sit down uh, with a page and say, uh, Lord, how should I play, pray for so-and-so today? And then she would just write whatever came to her head and then she would stop and look at it. And then she would say, this is of the Lord, and this is not. And then she would pray that way. And each day she would do that. And then her prayers would change as the situation changed. The Lord would show her what to pray for. Well, now pray for this. She's passed on. Uh, she's in the glory of heaven now. And her kids have found her war journals with their names in them, with the dates and the times that she prayed for these things. And intelligence only looks like intelligence after the fact. Before the fact, it looks like paranoia and conspiracy. <laughs> right? So this morning, I preached a sermon on the coming economic control. Now that could sound like a lot of paranoia and conspiracy stuff. But if it happens next week, you'll all call me prophet. <laughs> Right? So, but this isn't unlike warfare. Uh, the guy who predicted the invasion of uh, Pearl Harbor sounded like a nut. No, they're not going to do that. And then it happens. And now he doesn't sound like a nut anymore. Now they're saying, okay, uh, maybe we should listen to this guy because he, he was right. Oh my goodness. The Lord is always right. He can show you what to pray about and how to strategize against your enemy. Rely on, not on your own understanding, but every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Rely on the intelligence that God gives you. Um, I'm going to add a little layers to this. I keep adding to the manual. I hope if I put everything I know in this manual, we would never get through this. But I'm just adding pieces. So here's the... <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. So the other part of intelligence, and, and you know this from the natural world, you gotta be careful how you handle intelligence. Because if, if the Lord shows you something, you gain intelligence, like I've been receiving, then a moment comes is, yes, but am I supposed to tell anybody about this? Like, should I preach about this? A lot of intelligence, you don't get to tell anybody. That's just for you. That's not to be spread around. Loose lips, lips sink ships. You, you can't. You don't want to be blabbering it all over the place either. There's a lot of uh, uh, Christian work today is covert. Did you know that? That we have Christians operating illegally in countries, spreading the gospel and leading people to Jesus Christ against the laws of the land. Don't publish that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been going on for many, many years. Uh, Despite the reality of that, that's why a lot of missionaries now are asking, please do not identify me as a missionary, nor tell anyone where we've been. Because we can't do our work if you do that. Because they'll shut us down. That's what we, you've got to be careful how you handle intelligence. Not everything the Lord shows you is for everyone. Be discreet. Know how to use it and where God wants you to use it. Any observations on that so far? Just in this section, it does state and points out that we gather intelligence and information on Satan, but he also gathers yes. information on us. And so he knows our weak points and, our, and can target them. Yes. Which, yeah. We, we <laughs> perceive organizations like Google and Facebook and all these other organizations as problems because they're gathering intelligence on us. But if you consider your enemy, your enemy that you're fighting against, knew your parents, knew your grandparents, knew your great grandparents, they, they, he knows your family better than you know your family. And he knows what you are prone to because of your family history. Now, understand in intelligence this, that the scriptures tells us that only God knows what's within the heart of a person. Only God can know your thoughts. But Satan, because he knows your track history of your family and you, has a pretty good guess of what's going on in your head. But he only knows it as history, not as a current reality. And that's an important distinction. See, now this is where a question a few times, how when I am even praying sometimes that it seems like somebody's listening in because there's there can be some misdirection there. So how does that work if Satan's not really hearing my well, prayer and being in the middle of that? If it, are you praying silently? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, even Jesus experienced uh, three temptations in the wilderness. He was fasting and praying. And Satan comes along and takes him out. Now, I can do the very same thing. I'm not Satan, but I can figure it out. I can look at your day, observe how you're doing, observe how you emote, and, say, and have a pretty good guess what you're upset about and what you're thinking. And having known, if I knew your family history and everything that's going wrong, I have a pretty good idea of how to manipulate your thoughts in a certain direction. But you don't have to read minds to do that, to have a pretty good guess of what someone's thinking. All you have to do is be observant. And if I'm praying aloud, does that... You, you can pray aloud. Uh, one of the ways uh, Satan can listen in but uh, one of the ways to shut the enemy down, not just blind and gag so you can't hear or see, you can just make it annoying. Because I know there are some things he just doesn't want to hear. One of them is worship. <laughs> it's just, you can't stand it. If you start praising God, and you'll find that lift. Because it is like, 
fingernails on a chalkboard to him. He can't stand pure worship. He just can't stand it. And have you ever experienced that where you're feeling a little down or depressed or oppressed or something like that? And you actually get into worship and praising the Lord and it just seems to lift and it dissipates. Well, the enemy just can't stand worship. So that's why it's a good way of doing that. Uh, the enemy can't stand the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ or devotion. So praise, when I start praising, Lord, I just praise you for being so mighty and great, for delivering me from sin, for giving me, for loving me so much, for the grace you get. The more I recount that, the more the enemy hates it. You just can't stand that. If, if you come into contact with a person who's truly possessed and uh, troubled by a spirit like that or under their control, and you start doing that, they, they'll, they'll growl at you, they'll, they'll froth at the mouth, they'll become physically violent with you because they just, they just want you to shut up. They can't stand it. I have videos of street preachers who just being harassed with overt, irrational anger because that's what they're doing. Because the enemy can't stand it, so they try shouting it down. That's the only... Otherwise, if they do that or they flee because they just can't stand being around it. I'm the same way. There is stuff I can't stand being around. I have to get out of the room. It is so wicked and so evil. I just, I, I just can't take it. I have to get out of there. I feel the same way about some things that the enemy does. Don't you? Sometimes. I, I just don't have a stomach for it. And the enemy doesn't have a stomach for the things of God either. So give him. If he's going to listen in on your prayer room, give him an earful. <laughs> just give it to him. It, it'll do you good and it'll drive him off. He, he just, oh, don't assign me to Karen's room. I don't want to listen. It is well, the I worst think, thing in the world. The other portion of that too, though, is to recognize that that is what ha that's what's happening. If you know your thoughts are starting to stray, mm -hmm. and like my favorite is, I know exactly what you're doing. Now get out of my head because that's not the truth. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Talking about him all the time. Yep. yep. Rebuke him. Yep. Rebuke him. Yeah. Uh, swat him with the newspaper. It's, sometimes it takes me a little while to figure that out, but yeah, <laughs> I do get there hopefully. Yeah. yeah. He'll want you to believe it's you. Yep. You're the one doing it, not him. But just, just out and out reject it. Send it away. Worship the Lord. Okay, offensive and defensive warfare. We've talked a lot about offense and defense. Armies in the natural world are both offense, defense. We've covered all that, learned about the parallels of the two. A great general in the natural world once told his troops, we are not going to dig foxholes and wait for the enemy to come shooting at us. We are going to move ahead and move fast. A foxhole is a hole in the ground in which a soldier can hide. And the general said, when you dig a foxhole, you dig a grave. <laughs> right? And when you are in a foxhole and fire at the enemy, he knows your exact location. So if you're up and you're mobile, you don't know where you're coming from. We will keep moving and the enemy will always hit where we have been, not where we are. Aim, fire, move. Aim, fire, move. Don't be a stationary target. The general did not believe in, de in defense. His theory was that the enemy was constantly under attack. There, there would be, not be any need to defend. He realized that the force, the moving force in offensive warfare, an advantage over a defending force. We will fight on our terms and we will win. There was an interesting series that just came out on uh, the History Channel. It was uh, about uh, Grant, the great uh, uh, general of the Civil War. And Sandra wonders why I like these because I'm applying this principle when I watch how the great General Grant won the Civil War for Lincoln, basically, with Sherman, that those same strategies also apply in spiritual work. And one of his was always attack. Attack, attack, attack. Don't stop. Just keep pressing. What would happen with generals before is they would win a battle and then they would stop and have a parade and send 
letter off to Washington to get accolades and praise for their winning a victory. But when Grant won an, an attack, he pulled up the uh, cavalry that he held in reserve and he said, pursue them. They're on the run. This is the time to go after him and finish them. We want to destroy that army so we don't have to fight them a week from now. And the best time to attack them is after the battle when they're on the run. We've got them now, boys. And, and he would hold back his fast-moving horse uh, troops so that he could overtake a fleeing army. There were some points as he went down through the south that the enemy was throwing away guns, ammo, cannon, everything, just so he could move faster to get away. And, and, and that attack, attack, attack. He, he said that is no... But he didn't always do that in... Um, in one battle, he ended up in a defensive position and in a slow retreat where he slowly went back. The enemy, the South, had launched a huge offensive against his position at Shiloh, thinking we could take him and destroy him. And rather than flee, like his generals were all asking, he held his ground because he knew he had resupport coming. And his goal, even though he paid a terrible price, was to weaken the attacking force. So that when his reserves come, that they would go on the offensive and maybe finish the Army of the South once and for all. And basically, that's what he did. At a terrible price, a lot of lives were lost, but he won it. He paid a terrible price for it, but he won it by not retreating. He gained a lot of ground, and pretty much that was the turning point in the war of the Battle of Shiloh. So offense is better than defense. But you still need a defensive strategy, even great generals still pay attention to both. Would you agree both are important, offense and defense? But don't rely on defense too much. In spiritual warfare, he who understands the objective of the warfare is to defeat the enemy, not to survive uh, an attack, but to go and win against the enemy. Weapons, every war has weapons. Have we talked about weapons? Do we? Can you name any weapons we have as Christians? The sword of the... Spirit. Which is what? The word of God. We have that. Uh, which is our main weapon? Surprise attacks <coughs> is another methodology. Terrorism, sabotage, ambush. Does this sound like modern warfare? Surprise attacks are a method used by natural armies at war. When do you use surprise attacks in conventional natural wars? You use surprise attacks when the enemy has the advantage in numbers and you're a smaller force. So when you see terrorism, sabotage, and ambush, you're looking at an enemy that perceives himself to be in a weak position, attacking a superior force. So uh, there are many examples throughout history of this. Prior to D-Day, when uh, the Allies invaded France, uh, Winston Churchill had built up a network of spies in Europe, working with underground, you ever hear that, the French underground? and so on. And their job was to sabotage, ambush, and create chaos, uh, to destroy supply lines and do all that. And they were coordinated to do it in such a way as to, to build up towards the D-Day invasion. So that when they came, when the Allies actually launched the attack, uh, they were in disarray. So it was a preliminary to a, a big attack. So. If we're seeing that going on, is there a promise that there could be an offensive coming following all this stuff? That it's going to be a build-up to something else. Do not assume the enemy will furnish you with warnings of his attacks. I keep telling everyone, uh, the, the enemy you're fighting fights dirty. He's not fair. He fights dirty. And the secret of winning battles in all people's lives is to realize that the enemy fights dirty. But the principle in the scripture says that in a fair fight between you and God or someone you're praying for and their God, 
in a fair fight, God always wins the fight. He always wins. But he doesn't win unfair fights when the enemy plays dirty. And that's when the deception or the lie, that stronghold is so strong that there's just no way to break through. So what we do is keep the fight fair. That's what I do in my prayers. So when I'm evangelizing or preaching, he said, hey, I don't have any problem with you saying you don't want God. <laughs> I have no problem with that. But just let's not play games about what that means and what you're saying. So when someone says to me, yes, but I'm secular. Yes, but what does that mean that you're secular? Secular means without God. Doesn't it? It doesn't mean, oh, we kind of like God, but we just, you know, we sort of have a compromise going. No, it means I don't want God in this. And if you don't want God in this, that means this. And whether you like it or not, as long as we can be clear on that, God will win this. But if you're muddled on it and you're and not being clear on it, that's when the battles are lost. Does that make sense? So just keep it clean, keep it to the point. Decisive battles. In every war there are decisive battles. These battles would determine the outcome of the entire war. Decisive battles, are, of course, are important because of the territory involved in the fight. If an army wins control of a certain strategic territory, he can gain control over surrounding territories. Territories that matter to us are not ground, really. They're people's lives. What would have happened if uh, someone did not feel the burden to reach Billy Graham with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Was that a strategic moment, the conversion of Billy Graham or Chuck Colson or Mother Teresa or did, did these, the conversion of Paul, a Saul to Paul, was that a strategic moment, a decisive battle that determines all other battles after that? Those are critical moments. Who made the biggest difference in the word, Bill Graham or the person that led Bill Graham to Christ? Mm -hmm. That's a trick question. <laughs> Christ be the person. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is the answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. But there are, there are some people, there are just, God wants to use that are critical. They're just the right person at the right time in the right place. If God could have that person, they could make all the difference in that moment in so many lives. And the problem is many times we don't know it. We don't know. That's why I say in Sunday school, there are kids back there who may be significant people in the future that are going to affect the lives of millions. They have to come from someplace. <laughs> they were all kids at one point. What if Winston Churchill was never born? What would Europe look like? It, again and again and again. It's people that matter and, and the winning of certain people. Uh, is there a way of identifying those targets and those important decisive battle? Uh, I'm now I'm getting onto something else. There are, there are other ways of doing that. So there are decisive battles for territories and positions. Uh, there are many who have argued that the establishment of the United States of America by the first pilgrims that came over for religious freedom was strategic globally. That what that did by developing a basically a Christian evangelical country that was based on personal passionate relation with the law of God, reading the word for myself, rather than having a priest reading and tell me what to believe. That was the product of the Reformation out of Europe, and they were looking for a place to practice that, where they, they just, it was discouraged in Europe. They found freedom in America to do that, and that impacted the world. Out of that came all kinds of things, good things, when they found that. So that also was strategic in many ways. Uh, how do you know when a, a battle that you're fighting is a decisive battle? After. 
after the fact. <laughs> you usually don't know it. Do you know what a fog of war is? A what? Fog of war. The fog of war is an expression that soldiers use. Uh, a general uh, sitting back at headquarters with his maps and his reports has kind of an idea of what's going on. But if you're a soldier out on the front line in the middle of it, you haven't got a clue of what's going on. All you know is people are trying to kill you. <laughs> and you're fighting there to survive. And in the fog of war, you're not even sure where the bullets are coming from and whether that guy is friend or foe, you know? It, it, there's a lot of confusion in war, in the actual battle itself. Uh, have there been battles that you've been in, uh, struggles, where you're not sure what's going on or why it's going on or who's a friend and who's the enemy? And you don't know, if, have you ever been in a place like that? Anxious and afraid? That's what a fog of war is like. So in that moment, you might be fighting a defensive battle, a, a de decisive battle, and not know it because you're lost in just getting through that battle. But it, as it turns out, in retrospect, you may look back and say that was a turning point. I, I have a little hint for you. Would you like it? How to know? The more intense the battle, the more important it is. The intensity of the battle that the enemy launches against you tells you the importance of that battle to the enemy. Does that make sense? If he's throwing everything at you, oh goodness, <laughs> something's at stake here. This is important for him to win it. I, I look at uh, the last presidential election that's still going on. I look at what has been thrown at Donald Trump and how easy they've gone on Biden. And what does that tell me? Republicans, Democrats, uh, governors, mayors have all come out in opposition to Donald Trump on force. Republicans, Democrats, the whole system has come out against him in this last election. You just look at the news site, you see it. Well, why such an intense attack against one guy? Well, what that tells me is this is a, dis uh, a decisive moment and they know it and they're throwing everything. They have spent more money in this last election cycle than in the history of spending money on election cycles to win this battle against Donald Trump. There's, Trump could even match the dollars spent and the effort put against him. I've often thought of news channels like Fox of being pro-Trump, but you hear them now, they're anti-Trump. They're against Trump right now. They've declared Biden the winner and they're moving on. They never really wanted Trump in the first place. A lot of people in the Republican Party that have been putting up with Trump are now openly out against him. They never wanted him in the first place. Everything is against him. According to Trump, he's not done fighting. The battle is still on, but it's critical. So when you think everything is against you, that's a critical moment in your life. And in the spiritual realm, they consider that an important moment. So. Another way I've put it to Sandra when we've gone through moments like this is uh, we must really have the enemy against the wall right now because he is throwing everything at us. <laughs> and uh, I, I usually know I'm winning when the enemy turns violent. Because I've learned enough, I've uh, been in enough battles with the enemy that he doesn't resort to out, uh, violence uh, until he's got nothing left. That's, he would rather deceive and corrupt and mislead and co-opt and do all those things. That's a better battlefield for him. To kill the Son of God, to nail him on the cross, that was his last resort. He had no other option. That was his last desperate. He knew that if he let Christ go on living, all the world would follow after Jesus Christ. He would lose everybody. 
His only choice was to kill. And so you're winning. If, if he uses violence, you've got him on the ropes. It's like cornering an animal and they have no way out. That's when they turn violent and they're no longer running. So watch out. That's the other way you can know you're in a decisive battle. Communication is very important in the natural warfare. Troops must be able to communicate. In spiritual warfare, Satan wants to destroy your lines of communication. He will try to prevent you from praying and from reading God's word. I have uh, conducted experiments as how Satan does this. Uh, I've had people come into my office and struggling with reading the Bible. And I'll conduct an experiment with them. I'll pull out a novel like uh, Mark Twain and say, read this. And they'll sit there and they'll read it. You know, word for word, comprehend it, no problem. Then I'll hand them John chapter 3 and say, read this. And then they get sleepy and tired. And, oh, I can't. And, and it isn't anything physical. It's just they could do it with a book, but they couldn't do it with a Bible. That's spiritual interference in your communication with the Lord. It's an oppression that he's putting on. There's a, Ray Comfort is a street evangelist and he told of a recent experience where he uh, was going out, was just feeling incredibly tired and fatigued and everything else. And he said, what's going on here? And he recognized that as a technique of the enemy. So he prayed, he shook it off, he went out and he found this guy and he had the most remarkable conversion event take place because he did that. So it, the, the enemy realizes, oh, I think God's up to this. I need to shut this guy down or I'm going to lose territory here. And then you know you're really pushing. Uh, if he's trying to interfere in your prayer life and your reading of the word. There, every church, uh, there are three things that are critical uh, for the growth of the church. One, people need to pray. People need to read the word of God and they need to witness. And every time we do one of those three, you will find interference with all three. Just go ahead and try. <laughs> the enemy will get, he will throw everything at you to prevent those three things from happening. Why? Because those are the three critical things we need to be doing. You must, we need to stay in touch. Did Jesus value the line of communication with Father God when he walked this earth? Did he walk away from people and their needs in order to keep the line of communication open? Were people mad at him because he left them to talk to God? So that's it. I'm done. I need to be away from you guys. <laughs> I need to be alone with Father God. And then he tried to teach his disciples that, and they were slow learners. He would take them on a few of those. Garden of Gethsemane and other places. Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. Communication was important to Christ. I think it better be important to us. Targets. In warfare in the natural world, there are two kinds of targets. Moving targets, stationary targets. Moving targets are the greatest threat in the natural warfare because they are offensive. They're moving against you. They're on the move to conquer territory. In the spiritual world, Satan is most concerned about moving targets. He targets the man and the woman who are aggressively moving into the battlefield of spiritual warfare to conquer the enemy forces. Satan would be happy if we would just all stay in our churches and our Bible studies and never move out. The churches he worries about are the people that are witnessing, evangelizing, moving outside their church walls, and then reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the ones he worries about. Um... Satan will attack stationary targets also. But remember, when you're on the move for God, you're a prime target for Satan. He wants to defeat your advances into his territory. That's why he is uh, truly against missionaries and evangelists and so on and wants to take them out. Wow, there's so much here. Attacks and counterattacks, mobility. Well, <clears throat> we can do this. Um, attacks and counterattacks. In natural warfare, when one side attacks, the other side counterattacks. The counterattack is an attempt to stop 
enemy forces from advancing to regaining the lost territory. Satan counterattacks every offensive made move made by believers. Um, this is pretty straightforward, but it, it always applies. Um, after I received the Lord and anyone I've led to the Lord, uh, I warn the person that I've led to the Lord. Now, you need to expect a counterattack from the enemy after this. You just gave your heart to the Lord. Uh, in the next 24 hours, the enemy is going to try to convince you that you made a stupid decision and it's not real. And that's why we t often advise him. He said, before you go to bed tonight, you need to tell someone what you just did tonight, that you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it before you go to sleep. Now, why would we tell someone to do that? Why is that, why is that important? Oftentimes, there a person who doesn't even believe what you're saying. That's even better. There's a, it's, it has to do with a counterattack. If I have confessed with my lips before the world that Jesus is Lord of my life, I have cemented a covenant relationship with Christ. But if I'm ashamed to tell anyone about that, especially the non-Christian, then Christ is ashamed of me. You develop a boldness and a stronger grip on your faith if you can do that before you go to bed. Because what the enemy will do in his counterattack and say, well, that was cute. You got religion. That was a, an emotional response. It was kind of foolish. I bet you regret you made that decision. That's the kind of stuff he'll have floating through your head. But if you've already boldly declared it before others, even those who don't believe, you are more likely to resist that counterattack when it comes. Have you heard this before? I remember the day I received the Lord, I was told to do that, and I did that, and it makes a huge difference. Confess your newfound faith before someone else before you go to bed tonight. So counterattacks can come in a variety of ways. I've gone into spiritual warfare where I know I'm contending for someone's life or I'm dealing with demonic forces. And I know because of my covenant relationship with my family that um, my family can experience a counterattack where I might not directly. The, the best counterattack is to flank you, to come from a quarter you didn't see that he would come from, to use a husband or a wife or a child or someone against you. But if you can defensively prepare your family and those close to you, okay, I'm about to go into this, so I'll inform Sandra, I'm about to do this. I need you to be praying for me while I'm out doing this. And, and for the kids and for the family, I got you covered because I'm, I'm going to be busy. And then when they know to be ready for the flanking move of the enemy so that we're not caught by surprise. Have we ever, has the enemy ever tried to flank us during spiritual warfare, yes. my dear? Huh? Yes. He has. What does that look like? It's not pretty. <laughs> not fun. Um... What do you mean? I missed that. Part. I'm trying to, I'm talking about when I would go out and do spiritual warfare, I'd warn you that I was doing that. I'd ask for prayer from you. And then the enemy would come around and counterattack well, some, on us. Yeah, sometimes he would manifest somewhat physically by the situations and issues that came up that were distressing and hard to deal with with and he, he he doesn't stop at just your immediate family either he goes to the extended family as well yeah yeah just bring it all down at once yeah just anything to weaken you there are three types that uh, Manuel gets into about attacks and counterattacks. Uh, frontal attack, this is direct frontal attacks. The temptation of Satan are like 
a straightforward frontal assault to the natural. These direct assaults should be met by resisting Satan, which causes them to flee. Um, have you ever experienced a witch taking you for a ride? This is so much fun. These things I've picked up along the way. Um, I was uh, graduating from Bible college, getting ready to go on to seminary. I had uh, a new bride. We were living in Edmonton. And we were renting this place. And uh, this expression of which taking you for a ride is an experience of paralysis. So you wake up. Uh, you can't move any part of your body uh, you feel an oppressive presence of fear and anxiety in the room getting on you and not, you can't even open your mouth or say anything and and nothing it, and then panic sets in and fear and all kinds of stuff that's what uh, the folklore calls that a witch taking you for a ride is what it's called did you know that and uh, the way you break it is all you have to do is say the name Jesus. That's all you have to do. You know, you'll break it. Uh, it took me a while to get my mouth working and the tongue moving enough to get that out. Uh, but eventually I did. And once I did, it was broken. And it was done. I've had that several times. That's a frontal assault. <laughs> do you think that somebody was praying that attack? Cursing? Cursing, thank you. Putting cursing you. It, that's usually why folklore calls it a witch taking a cry, because that's a way of saying uh, someone invited the spirit on you to do that. Uh, that's the normal thing. I don't know who was doing it or if, if that were the case. It, it just occurred. But I imagine that it was by invitation that someone in the area became aware and then did that. So it's possible. But uh, that's an example of frontal assault. Another one might be uh, you're a pastor of a church and then uh, parties within that church want you fired or out or something like that. That's a, not an uncommon <laughs> one. The strife within the body of Christ and then all sorts of false accusations are made. And that's a frontal assault. Go on, take you out. Uh, I guess being stoned to death as a frontal assault or assassinations, those, those happen too, right? Beheadings, those are frontal assaults. Uh, all of which are happening in the world. A uh, siege or blockade. A siege or a blockade in the natural world is when the enemy takes control of a territory not belonging to him. Spiritual bondage is similar to a siege or a blockade in the natural world. The enemy breaks through the spiritual walls and part of your life is brought under his control. He does not actually possess the area, but he prevents you from functioning properly for God's glory. So the way to deal with the spiritual siege or blockade is by using the power of binding and loosing learned in this course. And then the enemy should be bound in the area of your life under his control to loosen his power uh, from that. So the enemy will try to block uh, or starve you out if he can. Uh, there are many examples of that. The other uh, example is invasion and occupation. When the enemy invades in the natural world, he occupies and controls the territory. This is similar to the demonic possession in the spiritual world. The unsaved or backslidden person is under the control of an evil spirit, which is entered to possess them. The way to deal with this type of attack is to bind and cast the enemy out. He also gains control when you... Invasions can... I, I was thinking of what happened to you, uh, certain denominations in Canada where they have, through diplomacy, like with the uh, gay community, have allowed, made allowances and agreements with them not to be offensive to the gay community. And each time they enter into that diplomatic relationship, they gave the enemy more and more ground until the enemy uh, invades. And then they take over. Uh, one of the ways you know you've been invaded and they've taken over is when their flag is flying above your flag. <laughs> so, uh, should uh, a church fly a gay flag? 
a gay pride flag, should that fly over the cross? <clears throat> Is that ever acceptable for any reason? Should, should any flag be higher than the cross? But you see that now, that's, that happens. And that's the way it's always happened. So first you make a series of compromises. In Nazi Germany I had the same way. They made compromises with the Nazi party, uh, the Lutheran Church of Germany. And eventually they gave over to the Hitler cult and basically Hitler became the Messiah <laughs> and basically head of the church uh, over Christ. And that's how it happens. It's, there are countless examples throughout history where this happens, where the Pope is more important than Christ, where, you know, on and on and on. There are cults in our area where certain prophets are more important than serving Christ. And what they say is more important than what the Bible says. That's, you're always in trouble when these things happen. So that's when you know uh, compromises led to an invasion and occupation. Okay, mobility, are we ready to move on to that? I'm fading, guys, I'm getting tired. Mobility, well, it's good to be mobile. Uh, our feet shod with readiness with the gospel of peace. Uh, a soldier will put on armor and take up his weapons just to sit comfortably at home. And there are times when the armor is counterproductive. Do you remember David when he took on Goliath? Was it the armor that helped him win? The, the armor was in the way. Mobility is what he needed. Faith in the Lord, right? You, you can take down a superior enemy. One of the things uh, that was fascinating in spiritual warfare was the development of uh, plate armor. Uh, I, I find it interesting because one of my favorite shows is Fortune Fire. And uh, they now have one with knights and so on. And they talk about metallurgy and, and warfare and what uh, these knights were wearing. And uh, especially in the Middle East, uh, in Japan and China, uh, a warrior could spend his entire life developing a skill with a sword and technique and style and be incredibly great with a sword. But a, uh, a peasant training for two weeks with a longbow could take that soldier that took a lifetime to develop out in two minutes from a distance with an arrow. There, Britain defeated France with a peasant army that was armed with the English longbow at the Battle of Ashencourt in France. It was the arrow. Great big expensive horses with shiny armor, but they developed an arrow that could pierce it and take down the knight. The longbow could shoot a long distance. They could take out a bunch of them before they even got to the ground. And you put out uh, a mounted cavalry on muddy ground, it's even worse. They're just sitting ducks. So mobility, the ability to move, just because you got heavy armor and heavy equipment doesn't mean you're gonna win. That could actually work against you. Uh, one of the things we could note about the early church and its remarkable growth in uh, the middle, in the Mediterranean in the Roman Empire is the speed by which it spread. And that if you look at the Apostle Paul and Peter and so on, after the persecution started in Jerusalem, were they always going someplace? They were constantly on the road, preaching the gospel and being mobile. And that's how it spread so rapidly. And the word got out and shared. Jesus taught us a principle of mobility when he said, go where the wheat is ripe unto harvest. If you get stuck in a place trying to convert a hard-hearted person who's stubborn and they're not giving up ground, and you say, I'm not moving on until I win this guy. You've just missed 40 people that are ready to hear it. And Jesus' answer is, Go around them. Go to the 40. 
Maybe the 40 will lead the one. <laughs> right? In military strategies, they found that one of the most effective ways of dealing with a stronghold is not to attack it. You know how you defeat a well-fortified position? You, you occupy the ground around it rather than the fortified position. Because the fortified position is always relying on supply and support. And if you take out the soft or tarker and surround it and cut them off and resupply, you can take them down. Isolate them. Move to where the wheel fields are white under harvest, where people are ready to hear the word of God. Skill in spiritual warfare comes through experience and application, just as we've talked about, just as it does in the natural world. Cooperation. War is a team effort. Soldiers must cooperate with one another in effort. This is uh, one of the main reasons we're doing this course and uh, been teaching spiritual warfare, encouraging people to develop their own war rooms, is because I can't do this on my own. No one can. We need, a, we need an army, not warriors. We need a lot of people who are on the same page working together and that we have each other's back and we go to battle for each other. Uh, I, I realized before long that I was always better off if I had people with me, spiritually praying with me, backing me up than just going out and trying to deal with stuff on my own. It always made a huge difference to have others on board with me. And realize that, hey, if they're going to be with me in the battles that I'm facing, I need to be with them in the battles they face. That we rally to each other, right? And that's our goal is to be trained, not only so we can fight our own battles for the glory of God, but that we can come to the aid of others who raise the cry and the horn to come help. Uh, the great uh, strategy of the enemy is to divide a camp and to get Christians to fight amongst themselves. But one of the ways you uh, defeat a superior army is you get that superior army to fight against itself. You divide and conquer. And uh, the enemy has attempted this for thousands of years. Has you think the enemy has ever tried to divide the church and get the church to fight itself? Yeah. And if he can do that, then he doesn't even have to worry about fighting. And we're too busy fighting each other. So cooperation, realizing we have one Lord uh, and one enemy, and uh, that it is not each other, uh, then we can collectively be united and not divided. Uh, there are countless examples of this in the natural world that have gone on. But uh, it's under the Lordship of our Jesus Christ that we find our unity and our fighting and our battle orders. Obedience. Well, I can't tell you how important this one is. A soldier in a battlefield of the natural world does not uh, do as he pleases. He follows orders from his commander. Total obedience is required. If you're on the front line, uh, you often don't have the big picture. Would you agree with that? You don't always know what's going on in the next hetero. Or <clears throat> you're just trying to make it through what you've got on, in front of you. And you don't realize the importance of how everything hinges on that. So you don't realize too that what you're doing um, could be one if you would do a certain thing because you don't realize what's going on around you. But your commander, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the one who works with you, the Holy Spirit, knows what's going on. He's got the big picture. He understands what's going through. And he's, he, he, when he asks you to go through something, then you have to obey and follow those orders. That's your only way through uh, to find safe ground and to win the objective that's ahead of you. Um, so there's a bit of confusion on this point I've heard. I just want to take a moment to clarify it around obedience. I've said before that I've come under spiritual attack by the enemy. Then the question comes, like, unreasonable migraines that I've had. It, un, in, at moments that it should not have had. And then later I realized I was being cursed, and I 
found out who that was. But uh, in the moment, I'm just miserable. I'm just having a horrible physical time. And I know, I knew I must be doing a great job because the enemy's using a physical tactic against me. <laughs> He's literally putting me on the ground in pain because that's the only way he can stop me. So kudos to me, right? But it's no fun. <laughs> I'm not enjoying it at all. So if, if I'm under God's orders and I'm falling garters and I'm doing well, and that's why I'm experiencing this, why in heaven's name would God allow that to happen? Why would God, if I'm under God's protection, allow someone to curse me? If I'm under God's protection, that person has no power to curse me. I'm under the, the blood of the Lamb. How can he curse me? The only way he can be allowed to curse me is God allows him to curse me. Why would God allow the enemy to do damage to me? Yes, Sandra. Why would a loving father allow the enemy to, to harm me? To develop your reliance upon him and him alone. Yes. And that's a good moral argument. But there is a <laughs> strategic purpose in this. And you all know it. You just don't know you know it. And it's found in the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did God allow sinful people motivated by the worst evil in the world to crucify his son? And to mock him? and put him in a grave. Why did he do it? Why did he allow that terrible thing to happen to the one he loved? To defeat the enemy. It was a strategy. And what he did is he drew the enemy out. <laughs> and then obliterated by the power of the resurrection. But is it possible that God might allow you and I to go through some pain and suffering from time to time? That he could prevent it. He has the power. But because this isn't about a father loving a son who always wants to protect his son. This is a commanding general putting his soldiers on the front line and risking their lives to win a victory. Is God a loving father? Yes or no? Yes. But is he also a commanding general out to win a battle? Are there moments in your life where he's more general than dad? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the difference. That, that horrible moment I went through drew the enemy out and I met him. His name is Gabriel. And uh, I get to pray for him for his salvation, for him to come into the kingdom. I now know who he is. And I learned a lot from the enemy. We drew the enemy out. I had witches attending my church. I had people cursing me. We must have been doing something marvelous. We, they were just coming out of the woodworks. It was, it was, it was amazing. Anyways, the, so when you're obedient, uh, your general may ask you to do some things that are life-threatening. Like you might say to Paul, I want you to go before Nero and tell him he's not a god and that there's only one god. He needs to repent of his sins and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, that's as good as an execution <laughs> to go do that. But Paul looked at that and said, how marvelous. <laughs> that my general would give me that task, that assignment. Is that a curse? Or, or is that you're the man for the job, you're the person for the job to do, which is it? So if you think Christianity is just about uh, coming into the grace of Jesus Christ, forgiveness, and knowing the loving of a f love of a Father God, and that's the extent of it, then you're not ready for warfare <laughs> or for following the orders of a general who will send you in harm's way. Are there martyrs? Mm -hmm. Are there people who are risking their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
Has God stopped being a loving father because that is happening? No. No. They're just in warfare and following a general and being obedient. Courage. A great general in the natural world once said, if you're afraid of being shot at, <laughs> you are whipped before you start. Fear kills more people than death. We have nothing to fear but the famous line. Do not fear in spiritual warfare. If you're afraid of being shot at by the enemy, you are defeated before you start. You have nothing to fear. How do you find courage in war? That it doesn't come from you. <laughs> well, the first thing is don't run. <laughs> don't run. There is a thing called a strategic retreat. The most important part of a strategic retreat is not to run. It's to walk backwards a few faces, fire, walk back a few faces, then return fire, and then walk back a few, <laughs> give up ground, but keep firing as you go. As the enemy advances, you are taking out forces while he does that. So courage under fire. You, basically, you have to come under fire before you can find courage. Would you agree with that? Do you find courage first and then go under fire, or do you go under fire and find courage? Go under fire and find courage. I think that's what it is. It's all hype prior to that, right? They can do all the training you want, but until you're in it, you don't know. So you, you got to find it with the Lord. The brave general also said there can never be defeat if a man refuses to accept defeat. Wars are lost in the mind before they are lost on the ground. I would suggest to you that is currently what they're trying to do to Donald Trump. They're trying to get convince him to concede defeat. Then he's lost. But if this general is right, if you refuse to accept defeat, you're not defeated yet still there for the Christian the way that looks is um, Peter Paul James all of them they can say you can kill me that makes no difference the gospel is still here you still got to deal with God nothing changes just because I'm dead doesn't mean you're out of a problem <laughs> you still are going to have to deal with this I'm just the messenger Killing John the Baptist didn't change anything, did it? Doesn't Killing Christ doesn't make it better for the sinner. It makes it worse. So we can't uh, lose just because someone is trying to kill us. We, we will win. No nation was defeated until the people accepted the defeat. As in the natural world, there can never be defeat if you refuse to accept it. Conquering the leadership. Oh, boy. One important general frequently expressed his personal wish that he could fight the highest enemy leader and the victor of the personal fight with settle the war. This has already been done in the spiritual realm. Satan has already been defeated. And our commander did it. Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection, he's conquered him. The final outcome of the war is already revealed, and God has won because he has defeated the leader. So, but the soldiers fight on. Uh, but the leader has already been defeated. Rebel forces of resistance are still in the land. Jesus conquered the leadership, but they use, but to us is given the task of overcoming these pockets of resistance. I would say that we're in a time in history where uh, the enemy has, over the last 2,000 years, has built up a steadily a significant force and is looking to overthrow the reign of Christ again. And that was today's message. So if you didn't hear it, you might want to go hear that. And uh, he's been doing it by overt and covert and terrorist means but at some point, he's going to break loose 
and do a frontal assault on us again. And that will be in the too far future. So uh, be aware that also can happen. So in speaking about commitment, the famous general said, we are lucky people, we are at war. We have a chance to fight and die for something. Many people never get that chance. Think of all those poor people you know who have lived and died for nothing. Total lives spent doing nothing but eating, sleeping, and going to work. But we give, be able to give our lives for a greater cause. As believers, we are at war in the spiritual war. We have an opportunity to fight and die for something for something important, for something that matters. And we're under the commander's orders and we are fighting for something terribly important. So in the end, that's what gives us the courage to fight the battles that are ahead. Well, there we go. We used two hours and uh, used them all up. That was chapter 13. Uh, very important principles in there. Uh, and the most key of that is to look at the natural world and of the uh, battles in the Bible and see the spiritual principles that you can employ in the conflicts that you're having right now. And to understand what tactics are being used against you by the enemy and how you can unmask them and take them out. Next time, as we go into chapter 14, we're going to go mobile and talk about how to invade the enemy's camps and how to take territory from them and get into the combat zone. So moving away from uh, defense to offense and taking it to them. And boy, that will make life interesting if you haven't had an interesting life so far. This will really get interesting after that close with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for today, for the great lessons of the Word of God, for those dedicated to your message, for those that are listening on you to these lessons and applying them to their war rooms. We pray, Lord, that you would keep our swords sharp, the Word of God, in our heart, that we might do battle with the enemy, both in our thoughts, in our speech, in our witness of you to the rest of the world. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.
escape the city. Come to God's country. Come to God's people. Come to God's Word. Welcome to Millerville Community Church. We're just a short drive away.